sports, academics, leadership. What's the connection? How can our young people learn life skills through playing sports? Can athletic participation teach principles of sharing and community service? Join us as a former pro basketball player and an internationally recognized expert on sports issues and equality, explore how teamwork and education can work hand in hand. Next on Metro Center Outlook. Hello, I'm Diane Trees. Getting better every day is the motto that former NBA player Pat Burke used to motivate himself when playing. He now uses this motto to inspire young people at his Hoops training facility. Pat, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You are a former pro basketball player. How did you make the transition from professional athlete to creating and running a camp to teach leadership skills? I'd have to say a journey. Um, you know, being in NBA and having the opportunity for the Retired Players Association to come in and, and talk to us as professionals saying the ball would drop, I would say that I was sitting in that chair going, that's not going to happen in my life. And when it did, I was uh, unprepared as far as what I wanted to do next. And the story would have a, a retired player who walked around the house thinking, what am I going to do? <laughs> I was fortunate enough that I had a degree in communications and I started broadcasting. And uh, a friend of mine asked me, do I ever train kids? And so the story began. Well, then your original concept for your camp, was it to teach basketball or did you start out with the plan to teach leadership skills? Um, the great thing you're asking is, was there a plan? Um, <laughs> there was conversation. Uh, that friend of mine asked me, do I ever train kids? And I, I share with people jokingly that, you know, when he asked me that, I told him, I have three kids of my own and kids don't listen to me. And then it uh, just so happened that we went into my backyard, started training, and uh, those two young men turned into 20 young people coming through my house in about a month. And then my wife asked me, you know, what are we doing in a sense of what are we doing to do this more effectively? And then we went on to uh, open up a training facility, a small uh, introduction to the business world outside of playing basketball and following a right. schedule. And uh, I realized then that what I was doing, I wasn't prepared for in a plan, not just in the sense that people you know, wanted something, but how I was approaching working with other individuals. Talk about the Hoops Life program. What's your concept um, and, and what are your goals with this? Um, well, first I would share with you that uh, youth sports and um, a camping trip and uh, the opportunity to get up and get out to school on time with a group of people are all related. And Hoops Life is, um, is a celebration of taking a sport, you know, whether it's a basketball or a football or a frisbee. What we use in this Hoops Life program is the opportunity to have children go through um, team building and leadership where each individual is uh, going through in 12 weeks an understanding of self-awareness. So Hoops Life 12 weeks provides a platform. Um, and it's not about a coach like myself. It's not about me sharing where I want children to go and telling them what to do with X's and O's, but really the opportunity to ask them what are they doing to assist the team. How do you connect the game of basketball with improved academics? How does that all mix? Um, that's a great question. First of all, basketball is fun. So you get the idea that uh, children want something. I mean, everybody wants something in life. Children on a basketball court will assume that the game is as simple as just putting a ball in a hoop. They've watched college games and professional games, and now they want to look to achieve success as well. When we know what they want, we actually partner with them and create, okay, so what is our plan together so you can achieve? And in working together, you're creating trust and a relationship that opens up communication and not telling them what to do. Well, the same thing holds true in academics. I don't know any child who shares, I want to fail. Um, but when you ask a child, what is it you want in your academics, depending on grades and attendance and focus, well, 
what if children at an early age were looking to be their best and they needed assistance? So what we do is we bridge the two. I can pick up the structure of the basketball court and when a child identifies that uh, maybe that they're not getting back on the defensive end to assist, the understanding of what it creates in everybody else would allow them, I don't want that feeling. I want to make sure that I'm supporting my team or my family. When you create that same understanding with academics, well, then you have the ability to talk about, well, what are the things you're doing as far as responsibilities at home? Your homework, how much time are you spending on it? How much time are you spending on studying? Also, what's getting in the way? And the academic side of it then creates that moment in time where a child, instead of the basketball court not getting back, it would be like a child at home not doing their homework. And once they know the understanding of how it's leaving parents and teachers and classmates, they start to realize that they want something different. And then we can balance a, a structured schedule for them with their assistance and ours. And it creates that moment where things start to change. So you can show them all the parallels that are going along. You mentioned that you are a graduate of Auburn University. I didn't realize in communications. How has your educational background um, brought you along with all that you've accomplished so far? Even, um, even with you saying that it wasn't necessarily always the plan in mind, how did it help you? Um, it helped me, well, first of all, again, as I studied communications, and I, I see um, there is an understanding that communication, of course, is so important in daily life, in, in all those moments that I played professionally, and in the moments that I look to create team now. And, you know, without that understanding and without the experience that I had going through college, with all the support I had from a young person growing up and getting the opportunity to study at a university and get a degree, well, I would share I wouldn't be here. And that would allow also the understanding that my plan was never just to play basketball. It was to be successful and to support people around me. And that's the bridge with kids is, you know, the basketball is going to drop, the football is going to drop, the frisbee is going to drop. But the opportunity to realize that it's really about the relationships around you and how you're working is the one thing that holds true every moment. You communicate very well. With um, the children, let's talk a little bit more about who comes to camp. What about age, gender, diversity? Um, who are the children there? Well, it's, it's again, it's, it's spread out. You know, you have the child who loves basketball. They've seen a game, they've shared an experience at a picnic, and they've shot a ball. And then there's children that have never played before. And um, that provides, again, that idea of an opportunity. If children are looking to have fun and they want fun, well, how do you create that moment? And um, the camps become an introduction. We do things in the summer that are just one week. Of course, you can't change somebody's life um, in a week, but you can introduce um, a different way of approaching teamwork, and parents identify it real quick. If I was sh to share with you that there are children that come in that have never played basketball, I and mean, there are children that have played many years of basketball, how is it during that week that they're dancing together and they're communicating? Wonder, yes. Yeah, and again, is it's an idea that if you ask somebody before the beginning of a game, what would be the destination we would all like at the end? Well, they would tell you, I want to shoot the ball, and I'd like to share the ball, and honesty, and um, communication, and focus. Okay, well, if that's the destination at the end of a camp, well then how do we create that line to get there? Like saying from A to B. And what you have in that idea is the children will actually share what it is they want and then we'd say how do we maintain that? And it's not for an adult or a coach to say what we want because they've already showed and shared what they want. And then it becomes an opportunity for people to understand that people make mistakes and children have the opportunity to be their best when they're not given an opinion of don't do that or get back on defense or sharing an opinion. Instead, it becomes a safe place to fail where trust is built. If a child has never played basketball for the first time, well then I would ask why would they ever want someone to tell them that's not right or don't do that. What about if you created the opportunity and saying, well, how could I assist you in doing that in a way that uh, assist the team. Well, 
that's what a child wants. They want to be better and they want to have fun. They want to be able to part of the action that would make sense. And so that's what occurs during the weeks. So you're able to mix all the skill levels, all of this together and make it work. How important is it for a child to have a role model or a mentor? Do you think that that's an essential part of, of growing up? For sure. Again, as if you took uh, a gymnasium, a room, space, and you put a bunch of people in it, whether it was a child or an adult, you would just have whatever happens, happens. When you'd put the same situation with an influence in the room, well then you have, again, another chance to do something. But again, it depends on what the influence is. If you take it in sports and you have a coach that's screaming and yelling, you have an influence in the room. Unfortunately. But if yes. you take that and you put it into a room with somebody who partners and you have a team of them doing it, well then you have an opportunity to support people. And again, it's not just about children because this happens all the time in our workplaces. Yes, it, does. it happens in our communities. If I would change this idea to say in today's society, corporate America is spending millions of dollars and time and resources to work with adults and they're going into rooms and they're sitting on top of desks and they've got a stuffed animal and they're throwing it around the room learning to be a team again and learning communication well these are adults that have played youth sports as well so where did we not get the ability to do this or where is something missing and again that goes to that same idea from A to B is from a child to an adult. Pat, how can parents and children become more involved or learn more about your program? Well, first I would say, well, they'd have to understand what it is. You know, um, if I share with people that children have the understanding of what they want and what they don't want, like they know what a good bowl of cereal is and they know what a bad one is, and they know what it means to get up in the morning where the team's working together and when it's not, well, the value is the first understanding. And if people wanted to be a part of that, well, then they could look at our webpage at hoopspatberg.com, or they could call our office at uh, 352, uh, and I'm forgetting the number. We'll, we'll get it out yeah, for you. I got it, 352-253-4667. Um, and they could uh, start a conversation because I'm always open to allowing that opportunity to say, well, what exactly? Is it? It's intriguing, but I don't quite get all of the things we're doing. And of right. course, it has a lot to it. Right. My best wishes for success. Thank you very much. Thank you. When we return, we'll discuss how the National Consortium for Academics and Sports seeks to change lives through sports. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Dr. Richard Lapchik is a human rights activist and an internationally recognized expert on sports issues. He founded the National Consortium for Academics and Sports in 1985 and serves as president. Dr. Lapchik, welcome to the show. Good to see you. Good to see you always. Can you give us an overview what the NCAS is about and who participates? The NCAS is a consortium of 285 colleges and universities around the country and the goal and mission is to use the power of sport to affect positive social change, to address various social issues. We started out uh, trying to ensure the education of student athletes, which when we started 30 years ago, it was estimated that 27% of college student athletes in basketball and football were graduating, and that obviously meant the universities weren't delivering on the promise they made to those student athletes that they would get an education when they came through their doors. So the first program we created was a degree completion program that allowed the athletes whose eligibility had expired to come back at the expense of the university to finish their education. And in exchange for the tuition and fees, the athletes would give approximately 10 hours a week of service to the community. And it sounds like a, a kind of idealistic thing, but we've actually had 33,000 student athletes, former student athletes, return to finish their degrees. They've donated more than 21 million hours of service and worked with over 19 million young people in the, in the outreach program. Now you founded this 30 years ago, 
is the need still as critical today as it was when you started out? Well, I think the needs have changed, so we address other issues that uh, now most colleges and universities have their own degree completion programs, so they're realizing that they really need to deliver that promise that athletes can get in education. But as you see on college campuses, one out of every four college co-eds is going to be sexually assaulted while she's on campus. Sometimes athletes are the perpetrators, not in disproportion. So we started a huge program in the 1992 called Mentors in Violence Prevention, working, giving people the skills to intervene when they see the possibility of some form of sexual violence taking place. Uh, we've trained on over 200 college campuses. We've trained all four branches of the U.S. military. We've been in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we've trained the NBA and Major League Baseball teams. And it's become very extensively received, a problem we never thought we would be addressing when we first started. Uh, but we talk about leadership. We talk about diversity and inclusion and have training programs in those areas that are also extensively implemented around the country. So you broadened your outreach as, as the time has gone by. When you're saying that the pressures and challenges change with the times, it sounds like your organization has done that as well. Well, we've tried to address critical social issues that other people and organizations probably wouldn't have addressed, like racism and sexism and homophobia, uh, men's violence against women. People barely even talked about it in the early 1990s. So. Today, our biggest new initiative that we can touch on later, if you want, is uh, called Shut Out Trafficking, working on the issue of human trafficking. And in all the cases, we use the sports platform to get people's attention because we think that people generally are going to listen to athletes speak if they speak intelligently and are trained on a particular subject to convey that information to the public. I was reading that I believe it's been more than 19 million of your student athletes have made outreach for middle school and high school students. What is it um, when they're making this outreach? Are they going into the schools or is it after school programs? The athletes who return to get their degrees give us 10 hours a week of service and the areas that we work on are diversity and inclusion, conflict resolution skills, uh, men's violence against women, and drug and alcohol abuse. So they go into the schools and after school programs, both to middle schools and more typically high schools, uh, to work with young people, again, that they'll listen to athletes than they might not listen to if it was a trained person coming in on talking about diversity and inclusion. But because it's an athlete, uh, the students tend to listen more closely. Did you select this age range, the, the, the middle school and high school? Is that that's such a critical age to reach out to? Well, we don't think we could get to the elementary school children uh, in, in an effective way, and that's why we chose middle and high school, high school students, but certainly it, it, it is also a critical age, particularly the middle school student in those formative years when they're going to have such a transition when they get to high school. And you talked about the volunteer segments with NCAS. How does this help the student athlete then build their own leadership skills? Well, first of all, for a lot of student athletes, sport has been their whole life. People talk to them about their game, whatever it happens to be, uh, but don't look at them necessarily as a multidimensional person. So suddenly when they're in schools talking about these issues, young people are looking at them as intelligent opinion leaders, opinion shapers, and it helps their self-esteem. It makes them realize that they're more than just an athlete, that they're a developing human being, and because they had that student-athlete background, can be genuine leaders in our society. So that you think that they get a lot of time focused or even pigeonholed in one area, and they're not seen as a complete student then? I think if you talk to any athlete on a college campus, they're going to tell you that students come up to them and talk about the next game they're playing or the last game they're playing. They don't talk to them about what's going on with refugees in Europe or, or racism in America. Uh, but when they do talk to them about that, they're appreciative because suddenly they're being valued for more than their particular physical qualities. How are you, how do the athletes come into NCAS? Are, are, you, are you making outreach to them? Do they come to you to, to finish the programs? Or how does this work? We outreach to the colleges and universities to join, and then the colleges and universities go back to their own stu former student athletes. You have what's called the degree completion program. What does that entail? It entails that the colleges and universities will pay for the tuition of any student athlete who comes back after their eligibility has expired in exchange for the, those student athletes giving 10 hours of service. No, no athletic return this time, uh, but 
in, in fact, finishing their education and uh, helping the communities where the colleges and universities are. Well, you're, you're helping both ends then. Your outreach efforts are wonderful, but you are also helping, the original concept was to help the student athlete and you're, you're helping both ways. That's, that's, that's excellent. Are there programs for coaches, though, um, to reinforce or teach this connection with leadership and sports and academics? Well, when we do training programs on college campuses, it's not only the student athletes that we train, but also the staff of the athletic department. So we do work with coaches, but there's also a program called the Positive Coaches Alliance that's headquartered out in California, but has branches all over the country, and they do a fantastic job with youth sport, youth sport coaches where young people have the first contact with coaches, which is so critically important to how they view a game, uh, develop the right values, and I consider them to be one of the best programs in the country, especially at the youth sport level. Right, that's excellent. Do your athletes then, when they come to you, do you help them, guide them into what areas, since you've diversified so much in the kind of outreach that you're doing, do they pick the areas? Do you help guide them? Well, they know what we have available and the individual university where they're coming back to is really has the primary responsibility for setting the programs in the schools so the athletes fit into those programs. Is NCAS growing with, with different universities or are you at capacity with what you can handle? Um, we can probably add additional, univer additional universities and for example we thought we were uh, at full capacity and along came this issue of human trafficking as such an explosive issue in our, in our society and we thought that we would be able to engage students and student athletes on college campuses and the goal was to be on 10 campuses last year and to reach a thousand students on those campuses. Well, we were on those 10 campuses for a week on each campus and actually engaged 20,000 students in direct contact in the audiences that we created, uh, both for keynote presentations as well as film viewings that we had. Yeah. That's an enormous success just to begin with. You have received countless awards and you dozens of programs you've started for youth and for student athletes. Has there been a mentor, someone in particular along the way for you? Well, I literally have just arrived from California last night where I delivered the eulogy for the person who was the biggest mentor in my life and biggest role model in my life other than my own dad. His name was George Hauser. We all know about the Freedom Rides and think of them in the 1960s. George Hauser did Freedom Rides in the 1940s. He founded the Congress of Racial Equality, he founded the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and he created the anti-apartheid movement and anti-colonial movements in this country. And he was also happened to be white, and at a time that in the Civil Rights Movement, there was a lot of feeling that white people should work in the white community and black people in, in the African American community, George Hauser had a bridge between the communities and showed me that there's a possibility of doing that. So he became that mentor and role model for me and it was a great honor to be asked to deliver part of the eulogy last weekend. I'm sorry for your loss. He was 99, yeah. he had a great life. Yeah. What would you like to see as a next step for NCAS? I mean, you've been so wildly successful already in doing good work. Well, it's one of those things where you really never know. In, in 2006, I would never have predicted that we would have spent our 45th week in New Orleans helping to rebuild homes uh, after Hurricane Katrina. We were the organization that has been there more than any other external to the city organization mm -hmm. since Katrina. Uh, I wouldn't have thought we were do we'd be doing human trafficking programs. In 1990, I didn't think we'd have such a big program on the issue of men's violence against women. So we really try to respond to the needs of mm -hmm. the society at that time. So I'm sure there's going to be a next issue that, that we're going to want to deal with uh, and try to respond at that moment. How wonderful to have you as president. Thank you. Good to see you as always. Always nice to see you. This edition of Metro Center Outlook is part of WUCF's American Graduate Initiative, bringing awareness to the dropout crisis and encouraging Central Florida's children to succeed. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, I'm Diane Trees.